Yeah, we had a few technical issues yesterday. Still learning this nonlinear editor. It is pretty complex and it got a bit overwhelming yesterday. It is a very robust editor though. This was used to produce Prometheus and Bohemian Rhapsody. And we're using it here at Forecast Lab, so I'm still trying to figure it out. Anyway, let's check out the weather. The teleconnections, maybe this is something we can do once a week, going over the indices and global scale patterns. We are in a weak La Nina pattern. It's going to be flipping over probably to El Nino by the start of summer. And all the other oscillations indicate weak vortices. And when we have weak vortices, we have weak prevailing westerlies, which allows cold air to ooze southward from Canada, as we've been seeing over the past week or so. The surface map for this afternoon showing a bit of a complex picture. Occlusion up in the Midwest region, Iowa, there's an occlusion in that area. And we've also got this wedge of warm air all the way up into Michigan, seeing 80s up there in the north part of the state and 80s down through Ohio and down to the south. It looks like some cold air damming there in Virginia. We've got this cold front that's basically stalling out there in Tennessee and Alabama and the tail end extending through Texas where we have mid and upper 80s south of that boundary. Now the dry line is probably right in this area around Sanderson. However, as you can see down to the south, we're bringing in that southerly flow. So we should start to see a few cells going up somewhere in Texas this evening, possibly east of Dallas. And then we have our next system coming in there from the Great Basin area. You can see those northerly winds around St. George, Cedar City, Tonopah, and Austin, Nevada. And behind that, a push of cooler Pacific air originating from off Washington and Oregon. And a split flow pattern with a jet down to the south and another jet up to the north. And that's supporting this Canadian system in Saskatchewan. And up to the north, you can see that polar air production continuing. Some very cool air, and that's filtering into the Great Lakes region around that warm air wedge. And then up in Alaska, they've been contending with a cold air outbreak. And you can see that up there in the corner. 1040 millibar high off the edge in both the Chukchi Sea, I think it's called, Beaufort Sea. Yeah, I think that's a Beaufort Sea. And in Siberia. And that's bringing these below zero conditions. And you can see there on the Anchorage newspaper, wind chills as low as minus 25 tonight. Talking about that blast of Arctic air, gusts up to 50 miles an hour, and that's going to hit Anchorage this evening. Let's see if we can take a look at that. There's the map in that region at this hour, 23 degrees in Anchorage. But you can see the strong gradient developing out there in southeastern Alaska. And as you go west, it goes from above 23 down to minus 8 at Bethel and minus 13 out there in the Nome area. Now, it's very difficult to find Alaska sectors on these model sites, but tropical tidbits, they've got it. And let's see if we can pull up the winds. So here's what we have right now, and you can see that strong pressure gradient right there, and also the development of these gap winds through those mountains down the peninsula. And as we go into the evening, you can see that picking up there. There's that zone right there of, uh, what's that going to be? about 50 knot winds. Anchorage is located right there, but the gradient rolls over them this evening, and then we see that move out to sea. And in the wake, colder air coming in. And here's those temperatures at this time. You can see minus 20s, minus 30s up there in the Berks range. And as we go into the evening, that cold air works towards Anchorage. That's going to be about midnight. Uh, central time. And then later on, wow, look at that. Anchorage wrapped around with these minus 20s to minus 30s. That's crazy. That's some very cold air. Although, you know, this is a model, so 
reality may be a little bit different there. But yeah, that's frigid air. Cold overnight lows tomorrow night. And looks like that kind of shifts eastward into Yukon and Northwest Territories. So I'm not too sure I see any sign of that making it down into the lower 48, but it is moving at least towards the east. So maybe the prevailing westerlies are picking that up. And what I'm going to do is use the 850 millibar temperature to track that air mass. And that's how it looks right now. Rolling that forward. You can see that cold air spilling there into the anchorage area. Let me center that. Okay, so what will happen with this air mass? Well, we can see it's spreading eastward there into Nunavut, and very little of it actually comes south. It looks like this ridge kind of cuts into it and produces this westerly flow, and only a few smaller pieces of it work into the backside of this system over Minnesota after the weekend. So it will be modified by the time it goes south, and it's not going to go very far south to begin with. However, that will be enough to reinforce a stationary front. So we're probably going to be playing with that most of the week next week. And that will be a nucleus there for thunderstorm activity, assuming we can continue to get moisture advection from the Gulf. Then going into the later periods, yeah, another slug of very cold air coming in from Siberia around the 16th into Alaska. And it looks like most of that heads into the eastern Pacific, which should help carve out an upper level low in that region. And we should see things get stormy on the west coast, maybe for the second half of April. Let's just take a quick look at the Fairbanks forecast. This is from Lobitos.net. That's a website that I like for viewing text products text forecast from the weather service and they've got a low of they've got a high of 12 for today low of minus 17 for tonight then a high of five okay so it's going down then a low of minus 30 tomorrow night with a wind chill of minus 45 is that a record looking at the wikipedia page for fairbanks the low is minus 36 for the record so we're not quite down to a record for the month but possibly a record for the day returning down south it's april we got to look at that thunderstorm potential looks like a slight risk for the cincinnati area down towards lexington kentucky and a marginal risk centered around the tyler longview area all the way back towards dallas so this looks like the front making its way eastward into that warm wedge, which has some moisture. So with the heating during the day, we should see some storms out of that. And then down in Texas, looking for a northwesterly flow complex of storms around Dallas, maybe this evening, moving eastward into the Interstate 20 corridor. And we'll just cheat and take a look at the high resolution rapid refresh this is going to be about uh, 10 p.m you can see the first cells going up right there around kaufman and those pretty much stay along interstate 20. they don't quite make it even down towards tyler but they do roll through longview this is just very small cluster it may not even do very much but let's check out the midwest So the model already has development on those cells out there around Lexington. And I would expect to see those ongoing when we take a look at the radar. And those move eastward towards the Charleston area after dark and start falling apart with the loss of heating. So let's take a look at our surface map in Texas. Moisture return is just now starting getting those 60s dew points into the Waco area. But you can see in that region where storms are forecast, it is still pretty dry, dew points in the 40s. The warm front down to the south, so I think these storms are going to be either along the warm front or elevated up in the cool sector, just slightly north of that warm front. So can we find the warm front? I think I might have drawn it there. Let's see. We got 90s down there in the San Antonio area, toasty, 93 at Uvalde, 90 at Brady. 
Okay, so this is turning into a full-blown analysis here. So that's what I have for the boundaries, and we're not going to continue the dry line up into the cool air. That's not really how it works. We tend to bring the warm front up towards the northwest like that. So, yeah, this all looks like post-dry line air, and I haven't looked up at this area quite enough just yet. So that's the scenario. Looks like triple point there near Brady. So I think with the warm front lifting north and the dry line maybe easing east just a little bit, that is going to put the moist nose along and east of the Interstate 35 corridor. Do we have any upper air support? Let's take a look at that. The flow looks pretty flat and channeled. Certainly got a jet stream through that region right there, right across Texas, but I don't see any strong shore waves. There could be one working right through there in El Paso. And yeah, maybe a weak little wave. I don't know if that's actually there, but that kind of coincides with maybe around the time those storms start developing. So possibly a little mid-level destabilization. So to actually look for that, I would go to the satellite data and try to find some evidence of a mid-level cloud field. Backtracking that, that's going to be around the Midland area. Anything like that going on? Yeah, yeah, there's a cloud field there. It's kind of indeterminate, but that does kind of support the idea of a upper level disturbance working through West Texas. So that would be something to keep an eye on. The moisture return, we've got some towering cumulus, moderate cumulus developing up there in the Stephenville Brownwood area. A little bit elevated there, but that moisture is aggressively returning north. You can see that there on the animation. And that's certainly going to erode the cool air and lift that front up to the north pretty quickly. So for this afternoon, I would be keeping an eye on these towers in case they move eastward and start developing. And I would also look for development along the nose of the moisture return. And just to show you the range of possibilities, here's the WRF ARW. I've always been impressed with this model. If we run that forward, this is a 12Z model, so the data is just a little bit old. But they're going for some very late convection around Kaufman, around 8 p.m. And then this little complex moving into western Louisiana. The Nissel WRF from this morning. Yep, look at that a little speck of convection around, I guess it'd be around San Saba, Texas. And then nothing for tonight. So if we don't see any convection tonight, that's going to be a feather in the cap of the WRF Nissel. And then the 3-kilometer NAM. Yep, going for that San Saba stuff northwest of Austin. And a few specks around DFW around 8 p.m. That's going to be the same dry outcome that the Nissel WRF is going for. And then... Stuff going up around 10 a.m., that's kind of weird, around Clarksville, Texarkana. So a few possibilities, nothing really definite for tonight, but this will be a good test to see how good the models do. And in the meantime, go to that visible satellite imagery and watch these cloud fields and look at how they interact with the boundaries, whether they form any interesting structures. This is probably the San Saba convection being indicated by a couple of those models. But none of them are really aggressive with that field, so we shall see. Anyway, I need to get this uploaded, so let me go ahead and do that. I want to thank you all for your support, and hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.